Hey runners, welcome back. I'm super stoked because I just ran my fastest ever marathon in a time of two hours, 35 minutes and 40 seconds. Now, just before the race, I posted up that I predicted that I would run two hours and 33 minutes. Some of you called me brave for posting up a prediction prior to the race, although I didn't really feel that brave. I felt quietly confident, if I'm honest, because I'd used my evidence-backed system that I've developed over the years for predicting a marathon time, setting a pacing strategy, and subsequently executing that pacing strategy within the race. So within this video, I'm gonna show you the data points that I looked at in my own training to get that 233 prediction, where I potentially lost those extra two minutes, and how you can use a completely free online tool to run through my evidence-backed system for predicting your own marathon time and prescribing yourself pacing strategy. While you can use my evidence-backed system at any point in your training, even the day before the race if you wanted to, it's going to be more effective if you start thinking about it at least a couple of months before the race. By doing that, it's going to allow you to be able to hit some key workouts where you can get some reliable and reproducible data to start setting a range of your physiological capabilities. During my build-up, I had six marathon-specific sessions that all had at least 10k of marathon-paced effort. So I could look at the data of those specific sessions and then run a comparison of the data against each of those sessions so that I could test the reliability and create a range of my capabilities. So here's a table summary of the six sessions that I did leading up to the marathon. After I've gone through the three key insights that I drew out of these to lead me to the 233 race day prediction, I'll go through what happened in the race and how you can use my 10 steps with a completely free online tool to do this evidence-backed system on your own training data. All right, so looking at the table, you'll see that there's more than six rows. That's because it's two by 10K and the progressive are from the same session, they're just separate laps within that session. So of these key insights, the first one I'm pulling out is just a basic pace heart rate trend. So what are my paces across those efforts that are greater than 10K or for the progressive that after a continuation of 10K worth of marathon effort and they're either at that same level or above. And I'm looking at how does my heart rate sit? How constant is it? Like where is it within my zone? My zone three being around 157 to 167. So I wanna make sure that my average is definitely within that range. And that is pretty much true all bar one, which is part of this progressive. Now you see, I actually sped up in this progressive run, but my heart rate, average heart rate went down. Now that was because I had some stomach issues and I had to stop for about five minutes before I sped up for that last one. So that data is a little skewed, but there is a separate data point that we can use to test how stable our heart rate is relative to the average. So what I've got here is the decoupling ratio. That's either power heart rate or pace heart rate. And that measures how, what was your pace heart rate relationship in the first half of the effort relative to the second half of the effort. So let's say you were at running four minute Ks at a 130 heart rate in the start. And then the last, the second half, your average heart rate was 150 at those same four minute Ks. Then clearly there's been a decoupling there and you're not in a metabolic steady state. So that's what we've got here with this pace heart rate relationship. And typically from my experience, you want it below four. Previously I've said 5%. But in more recent times, I've seen that number be more accurate around three to four percent. So for my times, my average paces, which are all around uh, 338 to 340 minutes per K or around a 550 to six minutes per mile bar one, I was able to have an average heart rate within zone three and I was able to keep my power heart rate relationship or my decoupling ratio pace heart rate relationship under four there were two scenarios where i didn't and that was in this progressive run and this is why we do more than one data point because this progressive run was horrible which is why my decoupling ratio is well above four percent and five percent for that progressive run luckily i had a couple more sessions where i could double check my data and i was able to get within that three to four percent range. So those are the first two key insights that you can draw out, just a basic pace heart rate relationship. Is your pace stable and is your heart rate able to stay within zone three for at least 10Ks worth of marathon effort? 
Then the second one being the decoupling ratio to test how stable and steady is your heart rate relative to that pace, relative to the first half and the second half of your effort. Also the tertiary metric that I took to test the internal metabolic steady state and environment that I was operating in, which was lactate measure. And for me, I wanna be pretty much below three or around 3.5 at an absolute max for my marathon intensity. And so one of the most accurate ones I had was I ran a half marathon at marathon intensity. My heart rate was super low, my decoupling ratio was low. And after a half marathon, my lactate still was under the threshold that I'd want for, I guess, my tempo aerobic lactate threshold one point. So that gave me a really solid data point to suggest that that 338 minutes per K or 550 minutes per mile was going to be achievable, which led to the 233 prediction. So then the third key insight I drew out was around running power. I use a stride running power meter. So those of you using Garmin, it may be a little too noisy to be able to do this. Coros I've seen being super stable. Uh, I don't have any experience with the Apple or the Polar. But what I was able to do was normalize my efforts and also draw out a bit of a conclusion around which shoes I should wear by using running power. So for the most part, it was around 375 watts for that 338, that 550 minute mile. That was in the ASICS or ASICS Metaspeed Sky Plus, but I knew I wanted to run in the Ciccone Endorphin Elite. And when I put those on, I increased my power output at the same pace by about 10 watts but my heart rate stayed stable and typically a higher power output for the same pace would indicate a lower running economy. But then looking at my metrics and my lactate numbers, I was actually able to figure out that I was getting more efficiency out of the Ciccone Endorphin Elites relative to the ASICS Metaspeed Sky Plus, which was something similar I noticed a couple years ago between the Vaporfly, Nike Vaporfly and the Alphafly. Alpha Fly, I had power, higher power numbers, but I was always able to sustain a lower lactate and heart rate numbers because of the way I was interacting with the shoe and the conservation of energy within that shoe, which kind of indicated a higher or less economical running stride, but there's more than one single data point that you need to look at there. So that was the running power. So I had that number. So if my pace was completely off the boil, my heart rate wasn't working, I had that tertiary metric to look at and pace my effort off. So for this race, which was relatively flat, I broke it down into just three sections. The first 10K, the middle 20K, and then the last 12.2K. So the first 10K, I just wanted to set out at 340 minute per K, just under six minutes mile, and keep my heart rate under 160. So that's like the bottom end of zone three, kind of just a little bit above zone two. From my lactate testing and what I had got in training, I knew that starting out around there after 10K, I can hold that effort and the heart rate would allow the cardiac drift without overdoing it by the end. Then the middle of the race, that 10K through to 30K, I wanted to maintain around a 338, so around a 550 minute per mile, and then I would allow my heart rate to start drifting into the mid 160s from the low 160s and then upper 160s near the top of that zone three by 30 kilometers, two thirds into the race, which to me is around two hours. That final 12K, I want to assess my heart rate and the effort I was putting out and then push harder if the conditions allowed, trying to drop down to around uh, 3.35 minutes per K or around a 5.46 minute per mile. And I had a very basic nutrition plan of taking 25 grams of carbohydrate with 300 mils or 10 ounce of water every five kilometers, which is around 18 to 19 minutes for me. And again, that's something I had tested. I was using a Morton 320 mix, just broken down into 300 mil bottles. So that gave me around 75 gram, 75 to 90 grams an hour, depending on how the aid stations were spaced out. I'll show you how the race played out compared to that plan I'd gone through. And then I'll take you through the 10 step process that you can implement with a completely free online tool. So you can have this set up for your next marathon. So the first 10K was just slightly slower than I wanted. Power was three watts lower, but more or less the same within the margin of error, and heart rate was really good. And so the second 10K, I wanted to start speeding up there. That was where I wanted that 
10 kilometer to 30 kilometer to be a 338 or a 515 minute mile. And that's where I was probably starting to be considerably slower. Heart rate was really good and this was because I sat in a group. So I didn't speed up. We had a bit of a headwind and I was really enjoying being in a group. My heart rate at times was bumping up to that 165 mark. So I decided to consciously just take it back a little bit and drop a few seconds per kilometer so that I could utilize the tailwind and speed up in that second half. So then from 20 kilometers, essentially halfway to 30 kilometers, I wanted to really speed up there and I did. And I was really happy with that. Heart rate, like it stepped up, power stepped up and I was pretty much on the mark there. And I thought, awesome, I'm gonna be able to close out really hard. From that 30K mark, I wanted to be in a position where I had plenty of energy to either hold steady if my legs were feeling the effects of the previous 30K or be able to speed up and close out that marathon hard should I have the legs left. What ended up happening was I pretty much just held steady, if not lost a little bit. A marathon is always so much longer than you anticipate. And with a headwind, that final kind of five to six K, I really struggled to hold pace. So I was very happy with my prior self for backing off in that group initially through that first half, because I was still able to close out with a faster second half, but I didn't throw it away like so many other runners did by chasing a time into that headwind early. And so that's really how it all played out, pretty much as expected. You know, I was hoping to run a 2.33, the conditions didn't quite allow it. Sure, I'm not gonna be exact in my predictions, but I was really happy that I listened to my body, I followed my plan, I made appropriate adjustments to the conditions. And so now, how can you do the same for your marathon? All right, let's go through 10 steps that you can use for your own data within a free online tool called intervals.icu. Step one is to create an intervals.icu account, which is completely free and I'll link to it in the description below. It's not freemium either, so you won't be forced to upgrade later to access the features you got initially. Step two is to set your training zones and I want you to tick the keep laps so that any laps you took out on your run are carried through to the platform rather than the platform trying to interpret laps itself. So if you don't know your zones, best guess is fine. We just need something to start with. Otherwise, watch my tempo versus threshold video to get an idea on how to set your zones. Also link to my calculator below. And we wanna make sure that we set a power number so that we can get access to our power data. You can completely guess that if you have no idea, but if you have running power, definitely set a zone. Step three, connect your device and upload your past data. Most devices are supported, and if they're not, then Strava is supported. Okay, step four, go to your calendar and find a workout with at least 10 kilometers or six miles worth of marathon paced effort. Click on that. Step five is to add my pace, power, heart rate overlay chart. So you can just go to the charts, drop down, go to the search, just search overlay, and then my one will pop up and you can add that to your chart library. Step six, click on the X axis where it says heart rate to bring up the options. Click on the three dots next to heart rate, add item, zone, zone three from the drop down menu. Then step seven, create a lap of the marathon effort section. Put your cursor at the start and then just hit M on your keyboard, then drag the barriers to match the start and end of your marathon based interval. Step eight is add my HRPI30S data field. So that is heart rate peak 30 seconds per interval. Then step nine, actions. Reprocess the file, keep all laps. So that will allow you to populate the data field that we just added. Step 10 is to finally analyze your data. First, we wanna make sure that our pace is relatively stable so that effort is really consistent so that we can draw that and kind of keep it as a consistent variable to match heart rate against. Then we're looking at heart rate to see if heart rate stays within that yellow zone which is our zone three that we added to the chart. If your heart rate is trending well above that zone three, especially in the second half, your marathon pace needs to be adjusted down. Typically, yep, your heart rate will trend up across an effort, and that's why average heart rate can be a little misleading. We can look at then the decoupling ratio to see if that is below 4% for that effort. 
And it's also why I created that HRPI30S, which is peak heart rate for 30 seconds within an interval. Was your peak heart rate well above the top of zone three? Because if it is, again, you need to adjust that pace down so that you can keep your heart rate low. You can repeat steps nine and 10 on any other session where you've done at least 10K worth of marathon paced effort, ideally with 15 minutes of warm up. You can double check your numbers and you can start to build a range of what you can expect come marathon race day. If your numbers are still looking a bit wacky and your heart rate's crazy high relative to what you've set as zone three, you'll wanna watch my tempo versus threshold video, The Science Explained and download my training zones how-to guide. Then tick the box to get subscribed to my newsletter and I'll give you a whole bunch more tips on what I'm up to, what I'm doing in my training and how you can utilize your data to be a faster runner. All right, all the best with your training. I'll see you on the next one.